Welcome everyone to the Cultivating Compassion Education Series. My name is James Churches, and uh, we have our guest speaker today with us, Dr. Richard Bedlack, and uh, of course our founder, Ron Hoffman, and uh, Eileen Gary with us, as, as well as many other staff members and volunteers. Before we get started, I'd just like us to take a moment and get grounded and fully present. So I'm going to ring the, the bell here and we just take a few breaths together as best as we can and get grounded and really feel ourselves here on the earth, wherever we may find ourselves and be as fully connected and as fully present as we possibly can be to take this in and really give of ourselves to uh, this wonderful speaker we have with us today. Take just a brief moment to consider what brought you here to bring your clarity and purpose to this time together and that we may really deeply be here for one another in the spirit of this gathering and this talk, which is finding hope with an ALS diagnosis. So now it's my pleasure to introduce, hang on a second, to introduce Dr. Bedlock. And uh, so uh, Dr. Richard Bedlock is a leader in the International ALS Untangled program, which utilizes social networking to investigate alternative and off-label treatment options for patients with ALS. He's also a leader in the ALS Reversals Program, which attempts to understand why some people with ALS recover from it and to make this happen more often. Dr. Bedlack grew up in a small town in central Connecticut. He went to college at William & Mary in Virginia, then back to Connecticut for an MD and PhD in neuroscience at UConn. Finally, he came to Duke, where he completed his medicine internship, neurology residency, Neuromuscular Fellowship, and Master's in Clinical Research Science. He is currently a professor of neurology at Duke and director of the Duke ALS Clinic. He has won awards for teaching and patient care, including Best Neurology Teacher at Duke, Healthcare Hero, Strength Hope, and Caring Award, America's Best Doctor, the American Academy of Neurology Patient Advocate of the Year, and the Rasmussen ALS Patient Advocate of the Year. He has received ALS research grants, participated in ALS clinical trials, and published more than 100 ALS articles. He lives in Durham, North Carolina with his wife, Shelley, and two mischievous cats. So welcome, Richard. Uh, before we turn it over to Dr. Bedlack, I want to say hi to Ron Hoffman, our founder, who'd like to uh, say a few words of welcome. Thank you, James. Um, thanks to everybody for showing up this morning. Um, I'm scrolling here. Uh, I see my friend from Iceland has joined us. So we have people here from all over the world. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, I was at a conference somewhere and it was the first time I, uh, actually saw Dr. Richard Bedlack. Saw this gentleman walking around with some interesting glasses on and a really cool sport coat that I liked a great deal. I had to inquire who he was. And the more I learned about who he was, the more I said, I really need to meet this man. So it took a few years before I was actually able to have a conversation with him. But what I know is I have great respect for his work. He's a physician, neurologist that in my view, truly knows how to show up 
for the individuals he's tending to. Um, He's someone that I, I think truly really gets the nature of our work here at Compassionate Care ALS and our ability to show up, tend to, and care for individuals in the way that we do. Uh, I so appreciate you being here, Richard. I love your work. Uh, I love how you do what you do and just who you are as a man, a physician, as a human being. So with that, everyone, thank you for taking the time out for being here. I know sometimes it can be really, really hard, especially those living with ALS and those of you who are the caregivers. So that said, Richard, thank you so much. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks so much, uh, Ronald and James. I'm big fans of, of what you do as well. And that's why I was delighted when you uh, reached out and invited me to speak for you. And uh, I love this topic that you wanted me to talk on, Reasons for Hope after an ALS diagnosis. So just wanted to make sure everybody knows uh, my disclosures. I do have research funding from the ALS Association, the Healy Center, and a company called Medicine Nova. And I also consult for several companies whose names you can see there. Mostly what I do for these companies is try to help them design trials that would both be acceptable to regulators like the FDA, but are also maybe more patient-centric than some of the trials that we've seen in the past. And sometimes I help them with what's called data safety monitoring boards, which is taking a look at the trial in real time to make sure that patients are safe throughout the study. So believe it or not, it's been over 23 years ago now that I had my, my first encounter with this disease, ALS. I was a, a resident at Duke, it was the late 90s. And you can tell that's the era of this picture for two reasons. One, I had the Jerry Seinfeld haircut back then. And two, it's the only time in my life, my residency, when I was wearing blue blazers and khakis to work. I was, uh, I was at Duke, it was a pretty conservative place back then and I was trying to lay low and get through my residency with, uh, with minimal trouble. So I, haven't, I don't have any blue blazers left in my closet now. But I, I will never forget that patient, how amazed I was by the story they told me and by the collection of physical findings that I saw on their exam. And also how horrified I was when my attending came in and said, we know what this is called, but we don't know why it happens. People with this disease become rapidly disabled and they survive only two to three years. And there's really nothing we can do about it. Just go home and get your affairs in order. And I remember driving home that day with just a sick feeling in my stomach that we hadn't given that person any options. We hadn't given them any hope. And so I wanna make sure that everybody on this call understands that there are at least three reasons to be hopeful after an ALS diagnosis. The first is something I've learned about the progression of this disease, and that is that it's incredibly variable. The second is that we actually have a lot of treatments for people affected by this disease now. And finally, we have some incredibly exciting research that I think is gonna lead us toward much more effective therapies here in the next few years and I think we're gonna be able to fix some forms of ALS, I believe in the next five years. So first, let's talk about the variability in progression. And there's different ways that we measure progression in this disease. One is by disability. And there we have different scales. The most commonly used scale is called the ALS Functional Rating Scale Revised Version, which is abbreviated ALS FRSR. And this is 12 questions each question is related to a specific motor function. So for example, there's a question about writing, there's a question about feeding, there's a question about dressing. These are questions that we ask to patients and each item is scored between zero, which means a person can't do that function at all anymore, to four, which means they do that normally. So some nice things about this scale are that it's real easy to use. You can look at the questions and see that they're things that are meaningful to patients. And we know that this declines fairly linearly if you look at large groups of patients. And the decline is about an average of one point per month. And then we also measure progression in ALS by survival. And there's different definitions of survival, believe it or not, the one that's most commonly used is tracheostomy-free survival because once a person has a tracheostomy and gets attached to a ventilator, they don't die from ALS, they die from something else, usually an infection. So when we're trying to measure progression 
from ALS, we use tracheostomy free survival. And there the average is about three years from symptom onset. And so it would seem from these data that one of the comments that my attending made back in the late, late 90s might be correct. Well, I've now been running the Duke ALS clinic for 21 years. I've seen 3,500 unique patients with this disease. And something that I learned very early in my career is that there's tremendous variability between patients with this disease. There's variability in terms of the slope of decline in disability measures like the ALS FRSR. So over on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see a graph from a figure that looked at somewhere around 40 individual patients and how they progressed on their ALS FRSR score all the way out to 84 months. And you can see that in some patients, the line was very steep, much faster than one point per month. And in other patients, the line hardly changed for quite a long time. There's also variability in tracheostomy-free survival. So we talked about an average of three years, but 20% of people live more than five years without a trach. 10% live more than 10 years. 5% live more than 20 years. And there are famous examples of people who lived more than 50 years ALS diagnosis. For example, Stephen Hawking. It took me a few more years of taking care of patients to realize that there's another kind of variability. There's variability within individual patients at different times in the course of this disease. So sometimes people come to me and they're on a particular slope and their feeling is that they're gonna continue on that slope, not necessarily. So my colleagues and I, we, we went into a database called PROACT some years ago. And in this database, there are hundreds of patients who participated in previous clinical trials. And we focused on patients who were assigned to the placebo. So there'd be no question of any sort of drug effect. And what we found was pretty striking. It's really not uncommon at all for individuals with ALS to have periods where they don't progress, which I call plateaus, and even periods where they recover a little bit of lost function, which I call transient improvements or reversals. And so over on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see a figure representing the ALS FRSR progression for one person over quite a long time, you know, well over a year of follow-up. And you can see that this person is not progressing on a straight line. There's, there's a long period of time here starting at day 400 where there's no progression at all. And then toward the end of the follow-up period, they actually seem to be gaining some points back. This graph down here in the lower right-hand corner is a little bit more um, confusing, a little bit more difficult to understand, but these different color curves, they represent the percentage of patients that had different degrees of ALS FRSR stability or improvement lasting different amounts of time. So if we just focus on this Duke blue line, this is the percentage of patients in this database that had a completely stable ALS FRSR score versus time. And so it's not at all uncommon for people to have a stable score that lasts 60 days. You know, about 80% of people in this database were stable at some point for 60 days. It's less common for people to be stable for a year, but you know, go all the way out to the end of this curve where we get out to 365 days, and you can see that about 10% of people in this database had a period of stability where they were completely stable for a year. So again, just so important to understand that there can be these plateaus and there can be these small transient improvements and they're really not that uncommon. In fact, the most famous person in the history of ALS had what I would call a small transient reversal, Lou Gehrig himself. How do I know this? Well, I worked with an author named Dan Joseph who analyzed Lou Gehrig's career in more detail than anyone I've ever come across. And these are some of uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's averages here. Over the course of his career, his batting average, which is the number of hits divided by the number of at-bats, was 340. So 34% of the time when he was at bat, he would get a hit. His slugging percentage was 632. That's the total number of bases divided by at-bats. So the higher that number is, the more powerful someone is, the more they're hitting for extra base hits. 632 is incredible. It's one of the highest career slugging percentages in the history of baseball. 
During Lou Gehrig's last year in the major leagues, 1938, for most of the beginning of the year, his batting average was 70 points lower and his slugging percentage was you know, almost half of his career. So he wasn't hitting the ball very often and he wasn't hitting it very far. And then all of a sudden in the month of August, he just exploded. All of a sudden his batting average was better than it ever was. And so was his slugging percentage. And unfortunately his improvement didn't last you know, toward the end of the season, end of August through October, he was back down well below his career average. So it's just really important to understand this variability between patients, but also within individuals at different times. It took me a few more years to realize that there's one other kind of variability, and that is something that I've come to call a dramatic ALS reversal. So I think it was around 2010 when I came across this patient on the internet, Nelda Bus, a woman uh, who experienced gradual painless limb onset weakness at the age of 43 and rapidly progressed over the course of a year to where she couldn't move her arms and legs and she was short of breath and was told by her ALS clinic that the end was probably near. And you know, this was a really good ALS clinic where she was. I know the people that were in this UVA ALS clinic. I know the doctors. She had classic story, classic exams, classic EMGs, lots of testing to rule out mimickers of ALS. Everything pointed to the fact that her ALS diagnosis was correct. And you know, as she got near the end, she tried one last thing, which was energy healing. And over the course of two years under an energy healer, she gradually recovered all of her strength. And she's still alive today, completely normal. And so this is now 30 years ago that she was diagnosed with ALS and progressed and then recovered. And so since I saw that case, I started asking around, I started scrutinizing the literature and talking to my more senior colleagues. And it turns out other people have seen these. As of today, I know of 56 dramatic ALS reversals. All of them met today's criteria for an ALS diagnosis. All of them had extensive testing for ALS mimics and none were found. All progressed to disability and then made dramatic and sustained recoveries of lost motor function. Some of these people were totally paralyzed. Now they walk, they run, they climb. Some of them couldn't speak. They used speech generating devices. Now they talk normally. Some of them couldn't swallow. They had to have a feeding tube. Now they swallow normally. So some people criticize this work and say, well, that's Bedlack, he's crazy, just look at him. He's the only one that sees these cases. It's, it's not true actually. The first of these ALS reversals were diagnosed in the medical literature by a very famous neurologist in the 1960s. And many other famous neurologists have described one or two of these things. It's just that those case reports were largely forgotten. And no one previously has tried to put all of these into the same database and study them to see what they might have in common. And so that's what I'm doing. I still don't know how or why these happened yet, but I have a lot of studies, collaborators all around the world now looking at the genetics, the RNA, the protein biomarkers, the microbiome, the things these patients took and trying to figure out why these happened and how we can make them happen more often. And you can follow along with that research on the website, alsreversals.org. But to sort of summarize the first part of this, where my attending was wrong is in telling that patient that he had two to three years to live. There's really no way to look at a patient in the beginning of their ALS journey and know that they have two to three years to live. They might have 50 years to live. They might have an ALS reversal. This disease is very different in different people. And what I tell my patients is, look, I don't know what you're gonna look like in six months or six years. Let's make you the best you can be today and bring you back in a few months and see if anything's changed. And so that brings us to our current treatments. Before we get there, does anybody have any questions about that first part, about the progression variability? You can also do questions at the end. Feel free to unmute. You know, I, Richard, I have one, one thing to share. Yeah. And it's everyone, I mean, what uh, Richard is sharing is so incredibly important. I mean, in our work, uh, I have met, you know, my friend Mariah lived for 37 years, was given a 10% chance of living two years and never having children. 
Mariah Fenton Gladys, you can Google her. 37 years this woman lived. And yes, she had ALS, but she never had a feeding tube. She never did the things they all said she needed to do. So, you know, what I really appreciate about what you're speaking to, Richard, is these are the things that are possible. Why they happen to some and not others, I don't know. None of us do. But these are the things that are possible. Thank you, Richard. Sure. Just want to make sure we... Yeah, so uh, Anne asked, could I say more about the energy work that that first example used? Yeah, so um, I actually found this patient while I was uh, doing an ALS Untangled review. So for those of you that don't know, the ALS Untangled is, I guess the closest thing I can think of is it's kind of like the ALS X-Files. If you remember the old TV show, the X-Files, there was a guy named Fox Mulder and you know he would field reports of unusual things ghosts, vampires, werewolves. And, you know, he would go out and try to scientifically investigate these things and figure out if there was any credibility to them. And ALS Untangled is a program that I started a, a long time ago now because I noticed a lot of my patients were going onto the internet and, you know, there they would find products that were advertised to slow, stop, or reverse ALS without what most scientists would consider to be very credible evidence. And so, I designed this program where people can submit ideas to us. We put them on a virtual bulletin board on our website. We allow the community to vote and the ideas that get the most votes, we write reviews on those. And the reviews are not just written by me. There's, there's now a team of us, 130 clinicians and scientists from across 11 different countries working on this together. And we've got a very uh, systematic approach by which we review these things. We try to make them as objective as possible. Once we have a review that the team likes, we publish it in a journal and the journal has agreed to make these available free so no one has to pay to read them. And they're also available on the ALS Untangled website. And you know, we get a lot of unusual ideas. We have over 500 ideas on our website right now that we haven't written about yet. But one of the ideas was energy healing. And specifically, someone asked me to look at the website of, of this Dean Craft Energy Healer. And you know, like, like a lot of these things that were asked about, what we found on the website were a lot of anecdotes, individual stories of people with different conditions who supposedly you know, went to this clinic and you know, got better, were cured of their various ailments. And of course, the one that jumped out at me was Nelda's story about having ALS, there were videos on there. Um, but we don't stop there with ALS Untangled. You know, we, we actually try to find the people behind these anecdotes. Sadly, most of the time, we don't, we can't. And it's hard to know if the anecdotes are even real. There are examples on the internet of people just making up false stories, claiming to be a person with some disease that was cured by some, some treatment. And, and those are oftentimes found not to be accurate. But in this case, I did find her. She was a real person. She was kind enough to send me a whole box of medical records. And after reading those, I was absolutely convinced that she really had ALS. She really did progress to near death. And then she really recovered completely. Now, was it Dean Kraft's energy healing? Short answer, I don't know. But I'm not aware of a, of a mechanism that physics or medicine can understand by which energy healing could work. That doesn't mean it doesn't. It's just there's no, there's no you know, precedent for a scientific um, mechanism by which someone can make healing energy come out of their hands. Again, doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It's just we didn't give it a very high mechanisms grade. I wasn't able to find anyone else with ALS who ever had this you know, result. I actually offered to study Dean Craft. I uh, suggested that we raise some money together, that we come up with a protocol and study some of my patients under his treatment. And I'll never forget his response. It was very short. He said, Richard, for those who believe, no proof is necessary. And for those who don't, no proof will ever be enough. And that was the end of that. Um, unfortunately, he died a few years ago. So. I guess we'll never know for sure. Let's see who else we got here. Um, uh, Richard, I was wondering, there's a lot of questions starting to stack up. Do you wanna just answer maybe one or two more and then we'll get the rest at the end? Absolutely, so it looks like a lot of the questions are about treatments. So let me go through this next section of treatments, another reason to be hopeful. And uh, then we'll see if we, if we cover some of those or if, if we still have them out there. So again, you remember uh, my attending saying to that patient in the late 90s, there's really nothing we can do about it. 
Well, things have changed. Um, now there are many evidence and experience-based treatment options for people with ALS. In fact, there are entire textbooks that summarize all the different options that we can provide for patients. The American Academy of Neurology uh, has sort of drilled these down to 11 of the most important options, which you can see on this slide, they call these the quality measures. And you can see that was actually back in 2013. There's new ones since then. And the American Academy of Neurology is actually in the process of revising this. But I did wanna take you through a few of these and just make sure that you understood what these different things can do for people with ALS. So the first one is multidisciplinary team care. Why is this important? Well, this disease can affect so many different functions so quickly that it's really impossible for one cl clinician to keep up. And so um, we have these multidisciplinary teams and they have lots of clinicians. They have neurologists, but they also have pulmonologists, gastroenterologists, physical therapists, psychiatrists, social workers, occupational therapists, speech therapists, respiratory therapists, genetics counselors, palliative care specialists, specialized nurses, dietitians, and some of them even have dentists. And what's amazing is this is incredibly resource intensive. You know, patients and families have to spend long days in these clinics. The clinics are really tough to, to build and to keep together because they take so many resources, but they're also very powerful. There've been many studies now that have shown that patients who attend these multidisciplinary clinics, they have much better quality of life scores. They're much less likely to be hospitalized over the course of their ALS. And they live significantly longer compared to people who don't come to these kinds of clinics. We also have some medicines. And so one that we've had for a long time now is Riliazole, brand name Riliatec. This is a, a medicine which, which belongs to a class called benzothiazoles. It's given orally. It blocks the release of a chemical called glutamate, which we think is present at too high of a level in the spinal fluid of people with ALS. And it also modifies sodium channels. And it was FDA approved again, you know, 30 years ago on the basis of multiple large randomized double blind placebo controlled trials showing that it can improve survival. Now, what was the difference between the people who took the medicine and the people who took placebo in those groups? Well, it was a difference in survival of about two to three months. Now you have to be careful because a lot of people will interpret that as if I take this medicine, it's going to give me two to three extra months of life. No, there's going to be variability as there is with every medicine that we prescribe for any indication. There are probably some people that don't benefit from it. And there probably are some who benefit a lot. And so we've had some real world studies where we compared people in a clinic who were on Riliazole and matched them to people who weren't. And some of those studies show a difference in survival of 19 months. And it looks like this can work at any stage of ALS. It probably works best if it started early, but it can work even in late stage patients. There's lots of different options for how to take it. Classically, it's a pill, which is crushable, but for people who don't like that pill or, or like crushing it, it's available now in a film as well as in a liquid. And most people in the United States will take this throughout their disease. I'd say 90% of my patients take this. So there, there definitely is, uh, there are a few challenges with Riliazole. The biggest one I have is overcoming the nihilism of doctors that my patients have seen before me and also of the nihilism of, of some of the things that are being said about Riliazole on the internet. Um, you know, the most common thing I see when a person comes to me and I'm the fourth or fifth doctor that they've seen, they've come across the country or across the world and they've got a whole bag of supplements that they wanna talk about and they're not on Riliazole and I ask them why and they say, well, they were told it only prolongs survival by two months and it rots out the liver, wrong. As I told you, we can't say what it's gonna do for an individual patient. It could have a huge effect in some patients. And furthermore, the risks of this are very low. First of all, any side effects in my experience are extremely rare, less than 10%. Usually those side effects are mild. They might have some numbness in their mouth, some nausea, change in the ways things taste. There can be changes in the liver, but these only occur in somewhere between two to 10% of patients. And Typically, you know, they're very mild. 
We don't have to stop the medicine most of the time when we see changes, we just have to monitor it. About 2% of patients will get up to a level of three times what's normal in their liver enzymes. And in those patients, we stop it and you know, the liver enzymes recover. Um, another challenge is that most hospice groups won't cover Riliazole. So for our patients in hospice, they have to decide if they wanna take this and pay for it out of pocket. The nice thing is that this is actually pretty inexpensive. So with a coupon on the website, GoodRx, it's about 50 bucks a month. And if that's too much, there's another website called HealthWell that can reimburse the $50. So most of my patients who went into hospice continue to take this all the way through their disease. Another FDA approved medicine that we have is called Radicava, also known as Ederavone. This medicine has a totally different mechanism of action than Riliazol. This is an antioxidant. It helps get rid of free radicals. This was FDA approved for ALS five years ago. And there's actually a lot less data behind this than there was for Riliazol. So there were only two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials. Both of these were done in Japanese people with ALS. Are Japanese people with ALS the same as people from other countries? We don't know. Interestingly, one of the two studies that was done showed no benefit compared to placebo. It was published as a negative study. But after that study was over, the company went back and said, you know, there might be a hint of a signal here in people who had ALS for less than two years, had a lot of function on the ALS, FRSR, and on breathing measurements, and were progressing quickly. So they did a second trial in just those types of patients, and there they saw about a 30% slowing in the rate of progression on the ALS functional rating scale compared to placebo. Both trials suggested that this was very well tolerated, that it was reasonably safe, but this also has some challenges. So there have been uh, some so-called real world studies on this. And while some have suggested benefits, many others have not. Initially, this was available only as an IV infusion. In fact, it's still only available as an IV as of today. And it's a very difficult infusion schedule. It's 14 straight days of infusions during month one. It's 10 days of infusions every month after that. It can be a challenge to find infusion centers that are open on weekends. This is so many IVs that you can't really use a vein in someone's arm. It won't hold up. So you got to put in a central line. It's quite expensive, about $12,000 a month. Again, most insurance companies will, will cover this, but not all. Now, the good news about this medicine is if you've been following um, some of the developments, the FDA actually just approved an oral formulation just two days ago. It's, it's going to have the same odd administration schedule, 14 days of oral squirts uh, the first month and then 10 days of oral squirts every month after that. It's not available in pharmacies as of today. We hope to have it sort of mid to late June and we don't have any information on Who's paying for it? What are they paying? How much is it likely to cost our patients yet? But we'll be watching this carefully. There's many therapies for symptoms that people with ALS get that take away from their quality of life. I'm not gonna go through this entire uh, slide, but we've got treatments for insomnia, fatigue, anxiety, depression, pseudobulbar affect, where people with ALS have trouble controlling their laughing and crying drooling, laryngospasms, constipation, urinary urgency, erectile dysfunction, spasticity, cramps, just to name a few. One, one medicine that some people consider to be symptomatic is new Dexta. So this is an oral combination of two ingredients, dextromethorphan and quinidine, and it was FDA approved in 2010 to treat pseudobulbar affect. And that was as a result of multiple randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials showing that this could reduce the number and severity of laughing and crying episodes. But fascinatingly, since we started to prescribe it, we noticed that some people have a marked improvement in their speech, swallowing, or ability to handle secretions. And so some folks got together and did a clinical trial and it does work. It can improve bulbar function. Now, I don't think it does it in everyone, but I have certainly seen some really dramatic examples of this. One of the problems is that the company never went back and got FDA approval for the treatment of bulbar function. So we usually can't get it paid for if that's what we write in the chart. 
So we have to use it to treat pseudobulbar affect, but of course, we're also hoping to see that it improves bulbar function. And this is generally a pretty safe medicine, generally pretty well tolerated. Because it has a little quinidine in it, we have to, we have to be careful. We have to watch for something on an EKG called QT prolongation. Now we don't have to do this in everyone, but anyone that has a history of a heart arrhythmia or takes other medications that can affect that part of the EKG, we have to monitor it. Screening for cognitive impairment, something I never understood when I started my career is that about half of everyone with ALS has cognitive or behavioral impairments. And most of the time, this is very subtle. Most of the time you don't pick it up when you're just having a conversation with the person. You have to do some specialized testing to figure out that this is there. So someone might ask, well, if it's so subtle that you have to do this special testing, is it really even that important? Turns out it is, because if it's there, patients are a lot less likely to be compliant with the things that we're gonna talk about in this section, the different treatments that we know can help. And probably as a result of that poor compliance, they don't live nearly as long. And so, you know, there's, there's no like specific guidelines on what to do, but in red here, this is what we do at Duke. We screen all of our new patients with an instrument called the ALS CBS, ALS Cognitive and Behavioral Screen. And if we find that this is there, we change the way that we talk to that patient and family. If it's not there, the conversation's mainly with the patient. What do you wanna do? You know, what decisions make sense to you? You monitor your own compliance. If it is there, we empower the family to understand that they may have to take a greater role in decision-making. They may have to remind the patient why they chose a particular intervention and why it's important to use it every day. It's not nagging if there's cognitive impairment. Respiratory, why is it important to monitor this? Well, it, it's the cause of death, unfortunately, and most people with ALS also can be a source of discomfort. And so it's really important to screen for respiratory involvement. And so you can ask questions like the ones on the ALS FRSR about shortness of breath, difficulty lying flat. You can also make measurements. In our clinic, we measure something called pulmonary functions. And the point of making measurements is there's things that can be done. So the first thing that can be done is called non-invasive ventilation. And this is a mask attached to a hose, attached to a box. And when a person breathes in, a lot of air gets forced down through that tube and mask into the patient's lungs and it helps them take a much deeper breath. And when they breathe out, the amount of pressure coming out of the machine goes way down. And the net result of this is that people can expand their lungs better and they can get rid of more carbon dioxide. People who use this have a slower rate of decline in their breathing function and they live much longer compared to people who don't. And then there's something called invasive ventilation, which I've mentioned. It's attached to a person through a hole in the throat called the tracheostomy. And you know, there's some pros and cons to it. Pros, it does prolong survival. On average, people who use this live an extra couple of years compared to people who don't, but there's a wide range. Some people may only live a few extra days. Some people may live decades longer. The bad news is that this doesn't stop disease progression. So even though a person may be alive, it becomes more difficult to move, to move. Communication can become more challenging. It also is a, a lot of work. So somebody would have to be near the patient at all times in case the ventilator alarms. They would have to know how to troubleshoot it. Um, and that's not usually paid for by insurance. So it falls to families. And so, you know, I would say a small percentage of people, less than 5% in the United States choose it. Those that choose it, if you ask them years later, say they probably would do so again. But interestingly, if you ask their caregiver separately, many of them say they would not wanna do it again because it can be very difficult. Nutrition, I saw one of the questions here. So most people with ALS will develop some difficulty swallowing and they will lose weight. And, and you know the weight loss is multifactorial. It's not just the swallowing problems. I mean, if it's harder for a person to get up and go get you know, a bag of chips or some cookies, then they have to ask somebody. And continuing to ask somebody to do things for you, it gets old after a while. Plus, we know that ALS makes people burn more calories than they used to. Their bodies are trying to fight the disease. That's called being hypermetabolic. 
And so the way that we watch out for all this stuff, we have all of our patients screened by speech therapy. They, they have specific questions they ask. If there's any question, we do formal swallowing studies. And you know, based upon how the swallowing is, we counsel them on what things might be safe for them to eat or drink. We also have all of our patients weighed and seen by nutrition. And in combination with what speech says they can eat and drink, nutrition offers specific suggestions on how to minimize this weight loss. At some point, many people with ALS will need to decide about having a feeding tube. What we know about feeding tubes is they can stabilize body weight. Some but not all studies suggest that this prolongs survival. And so we've got like this complicated algorithm that we're paying attention to in the clinic as far as when to have a feeding tube conversation. Most obvious time is if a person is running out of things they can safely swallow. The next most obvious time is if no matter what we do, we can't stop the weight loss. And then finally, one other time that we'll have a feeding tube conversation is when the breathing capacity is, is getting down around 50% of predicted. And that's true even if people don't have any problems swallowing, don't have any problems maintaining their weight. And you might ask, well, why? Why would you put a feeding tube in someone like that? Well, the reason is that this is an operation. It's a pretty simple operation at my institution. It's in and out the same day, but they have to give some sort of anesthesia if a surgeon does it. And you know, surgeons don't like to give anesthesia to people with real low breathing capacity because they might die on the table. So there's a lot less complications as far as getting a feeding tube if you do it when the breathing is still pretty good. Communication, you know, we have now a knowledge of how important this is, especially you know, in today's world. Communication means a lot of different things, not just talking, but you know, using the internet. We know this is really important as far as social closeness. We all you know, saw that uh, illustrated you know, very poignantly during the pandemic when we couldn't be out and around with our friends. And it becomes more challenging. And there's no studies to tell us you know, how to monitor and, and treat people when communication becomes more swallowing. So we have all of our patients seen by speech therapy. We have a screening that we do called the grandfather passage. Basically, we ask people to read a passage and we see how fast they can do it and how intelligible. And for those who are starting to have trouble, we roll out lots of different options. And these may be as simple as a, a letter board that you see in the picture at the top there. And we've got some really high tech options now, not only eye gaze options, but we're starting to explore what are called brain computer interfaces, where it looks like we're going to be able to connect a person just using their brain waves to devices like computers that can type and surf the internet like things like wheelchairs, maybe even to exoskeletons that might someday allow someone to stand up and walk and use their arms again. And then of course, ambulation, activities of daily living, all these things that we take for granted are affected in ALS and can rob a person of independence, quality of life, they can make a person unsafe. And so all of our patients are seen by PT and OT and we take a look at how everybody's getting around, how they're transferring, we screen for falls, we review how well they're dressing and feeding and toileting and driving. And there's lots of different interventions, equipment, education that we can offer to make those things easier on patients and families. And then there's other key components that were not part of the American Academy of Neurology's list. Disability benefits. Many people get ALS and you know they're in the prime of their careers. Their, their peak earning years. So we've got to figure out ways to be able to keep money coming in. And I think these are especially important for veterans because ALS is considered to be a service connected illness. So there's some incredible benefits for veterans. And again, it's shocking to me how many times I'll see a veteran with ALS and I'm the third doctor to see them and they didn't even know about these, these special benefits. Home modifications, home care, which I know this group, uh, is a huge champion of education. You know, the internet is just full of information. Not all of it's credible, unfortunately. And so it's, it's good to sort of hear from your team, you know, what websites might be better to focus on. And then, you know, just psychosocial support. And on our team, that's provided by the neurologist as well as our social worker. So I'm gonna pause here and, and see if we've got all of our questions about treatments answered.
yeah, I'm seeing a lot of, of a lot of questions that maybe would be better for the research part of this. So one of them was about diet. So there really isn't any data that one particular diet is better than another in terms of the progression of ALS. And again, this is something that's bandied about on many websites, but the reality is there, there isn't. We've tried to study this and we haven't found big differences in different types of diets. But what we do know is weight loss is bad. It seems like when people start to lose weight with their ALS, their progression rate often accelerates. And to me, that makes tons of sense. You know, there's a dance going on in everyone's body between whatever is, is out there that's trying to kill the motor neurons and the body's ability to heal itself. And that healing process is incredibly energy dependent. You need calories to fuel the best possible response in a person's body to ALS. And so one of the things I hate to see is someone come to the clinic who's on some strange diet that was recommended by another clinician that doesn't have any data behind it. And since they started the, the diet, they've lost you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds and their progression has accelerated. So what I tell folks is look, the main thing is calories. Right now, until somebody shows us that one particular type of diet is better, we gotta, we gotta get those calories in enough calories to stop the weight loss. Going through just to see if there's, ah, uh, good John, great question. Does really attack work for PLS? Short answer, we don't know. I'll give you my opinion on this. I personally believe that ALS is a spectrum, you know, in its, in its most classic form, both upper and lower motor neurons are affected. But all the way on one side, there are people who only ever have evidence of their lower motor neurons being affected. We call that disease progressive muscular atrophy. Interestingly, if you do autopsies on those patients who never had any evidence of upper motor neuron involvement in life, most of them have upper motor neuron involvement. So now there's a new set of diagnostic criteria for ALS called the Gold Coast criteria. And for the first time, progressive muscular atrophy is considered to be ALS. All the way out on the other extreme is PLS, where only the upper motor neurons are affected. Again, when I say only the upper motor neurons are affected, that's what we can see on our exams. But in my experience, in many patients who were diagnosed with PLS, if you follow them long enough, you will see signs that the lower motor neurons are becoming affected. You will either see muscle atrophy, or if you do EMGs every year, you will eventually see subtle EMG changes. So to me, it's all ALS. And I think that the things that I mentioned to you before should really work for everyone. Question about a possible side effect of really is all extreme tiredness. Yeah, again, you know, fatigue is one of those things that some people do notice. The problem with figuring it out is that ALS can also cause fatigue. And so what I usually tell my patients is, look, if you feel like you're a lot more tired since you started the really is all, let's go ahead and stop it for a couple of weeks. And if you feel much better, well then, okay, it may not be worth taking something that makes you feel really exhausted every day, you know, for the, for the small slowing that this disease, that this medicine has on this disease. But again, some of my patients just come back and say, yeah, it wasn't the medicine, it's just the ALS. And, you know, treatment of fatigue is, is complicated. It starts with energy conservation. We ask our patients to break their day down into smaller parts. And then there are some medications that can be helpful. Um, one is called modafinil that I've seen help some of my patients. And again, good John, uh, great point. Not, not every country is the same as far as, you know, what can get paid for. And I think um, one of the things that is, is fascinating and terrible to me is if you look across the world at the percentage of people that decide to have a tracheostomy and invasive ventilation, in the United States, it's less than 5% of patients with ALS decide to do that. In Japan, it's more than 50%. Now, why is that? Well, there may be a lot of reasons, but one reason is that in Japan, the medical system pays for 24 seven care at home for people who do that. Stephen asked, how do you weigh yourself when you're homebound in a wheelchair? Yeah, so Stephen, there are wheelchair scales. And so one, one simple way to do it is to get a wheelchair scale figure out what your wheelchair weighs and then get yourself up on the wheelchair scale and see what that total number is and then subtract 
the weight of the wheelchair and you'll know. Now we found in our clinic that this is not ideal because wheelchairs change over time. You know, people put new parts on them. Um, and so we actually have a scale that's built into a Hoyer lift, just lifts the patient out of their chair and it weighs them and we find that to be a lot more accurate, but I think those are a lot more expensive. Okay, oh, some of this other stuff is, is I'm gonna, I'm going to defer to the next section here. Yeah. So one question I did wanna just uh, answer here while we're on this section, can you get off a tracheostomy after going on one? So yes, of course, you never have to continue any intervention that you don't want anymore. And so there are two ways that could happen. One, of course, we hope that people would have an ALS reversal. But as I said earlier, that's extremely rare. The other is I've had some people um, after a few years, you know, with their trach and their invasive ventilation, reach out to me and say, you know what, my family and I have had enough. We don't want this anymore. And so, you know, what, what's, our, what's our option for getting through the rest of this? And it's perfectly okay to admit that person to hospice, put them on some medicine so that they're not uncomfortable and gradually wean them off the ventilator. And that's the end of that person's life but it's a very peaceful end. And yeah, the same thing's true of a feeding tube. Feeding tubes can always be taken out. And again, hopefully that's because of an ALS reversal, but for some people, they're just, they're just tired of, of doing it and they want it out. Okay. So let's finish up here with the third reason for hope and that's research. So of course we all want the same thing here. We wanna care for this disease. And I think it's worth understanding why we don't have one yet. It's four reasons. First, the diagnosis of ALS, it takes too long. Second, we don't traditionally know what causes most cases. Third, the ways that we've been doing research for the last hundred years have been suboptimal. They've been inefficient. And then finally, I personally don't think we're getting enough drugs into enough different patients. And there's a, there's a wonderful slogan that I like from um, the folks at IMALS called drugs in bodies. I agree, we need to get more drugs in more bodies. So let me show you how we're finding ways around some of these traditional barriers to a cure. The diagnosis. So most of you know that the diagnosis of ALS is clinical. There's got to be a certain story, certain exam findings, certain EMG findings, and then there's got to be testing to rule out mimickers. And this whole journey from the first symptoms of ALS to where you go and get a definitive diagnosis, which is typically at a specialized ALS clinic, it takes about a year. And that's a, that's a terribly long interval. It's a time of great uncertainty and frustration. Uh, many people wind up paying for getting treatments that are not helpful, including surgeries. 15% of my patients have had unnecessary surgeries. And we think that by the time people get an ALS diagnosis now, about half of all their motor neurons are lost. And that means our treatments are gonna be less effective. And it also means they might've progressed to where they don't even qualify for a lot of the clinical trials that are being offered. So what's being done? Well, I think this is very exciting. We're starting to find some biomarkers that might allow us to make an ALS diagnosis much sooner. And you know, the, the one that's furthest along, the one that I think is most exciting is called neural filaments. These are um, proteins that are released from motor neurons when they die. They're released into the spinal fluid. They can also be released into the blood. And so my colleague at the University of Miami Michael Benatar has published this beautiful work. He's been following family members of, of people with ALS where there's a gene that is known to be in the family. And he calls this pre-falls, pre-symptomatic familial ALS. And what he found is that in these patients, these family members who have a gene but no symptoms, within a year of when they have a spike in these neural filaments in their spinal fluid and blood, they start to develop symptoms. And so it looks like we may be on the cusp of being able to diagnose ALS, at least in some people, before there's even any symptoms. And I have, I have a tremendous optimism that our treatments are gonna work much better in patients like this. We also know a lot of the causes of ALS now, at least genetic causes. So about 12% of patients have a gene. And um, we now know of more than 30 different genes that can cause this disease. And we keep discovering more. It seems like every month now I see another paper about another gene. 
And some of these genetic mutations, we understand a lot better than others. So there's one called SOD1, the first gene that we ever discovered. It causes ALS in about 3% of everybody with the disease. We think that these genetic mutations create a mutant protein that gains a new toxic function. And that may sound like very simplistic, but knowing that means we know exactly what we need to do for these people to fix their ALS. We need to knock out as much of this protein as we can. And you may have heard that there was a trial called uh, Toferson that came out a few months ago. And this was a, uh, something called an antisense oligonucleotide. It, it basically turned down the mutant gene's ability to make mutant protein. Unfortunately, the trial was negative. There wasn't any real convincing clinical benefits in people with these mutations who received this drug. Now, I don't think that that's the end of gene therapy in ALS by any means. It's possible that we treated these patients too late in their disease. It's possible that the 35% reduction in the protein was not enough. It's possible that six months of treatment was not long enough to see an effect. And so there are now new iterations. They're gonna to try Toferson in these pre-symptomatic familial ALS patients. And there's a lot of other ways in trials now to reduce this mutant SOD1 protein. A much more common but less understood genetic cause of ALS is C9ORF72. So on this gene, there can be a repeating sequence and it turns out that causes somewhere between five and 7% of all ALS. And there's some controversy in exactly how these repeats cause disease. Some people think it's a loss of function, a loss of the normal function of the protein. Most people think it's a toxic gain of function, either through something which is called RNA foci or something called dipeptide repeat proteins. Now, once again, Biogen tried an antisense approach for people with C9 ORF72, tried to turn down the amount of protein product coming off of this mutant gene. It didn't work, that was abandoned recently, but there's a ton of other research underway to try to manipulate C9 in different ways. And I'm still very excited that we might soon have a way to slow stop or reverse SOD1 or C9 ALS in the next few years. So the other 88 to 90% of people where we can't find a gene, we call that sporadic ALS. And I think there's a couple of very exciting theories about why this happens. One is an infectious theory and the other is a toxic theory. So the infectious theory, I think, I think sort of started back in the eighties when young homosexual men started coming in with a combination of HIV and ALS. And of course, you know, ALS is fairly rare in young people. And so people started to wonder, is there, is there you know, some sort of way that HIV virus could be causing this ALS-like disease? Well, as we develop better therapies for HIV, we answered the question, yes. In patients that have both HIV and ALS, when we treat the HIV, many times the ALS goes away. So clearly the HIV virus can cause an ALS-like disease. And so people have now been searching for another similar type of virus. And I think they may have recently found it. There's something called human endogenous retrovirus K. This is a virus that sits in our neurons. All of us have this, we got it from our ancestors. But we used to think this was just junk. It sat around and didn't do anything. It turns out that people with sporadic ALS are far more likely to express this virus. It gets out and starts doing bad things compared to healthy controls. If we put this retrovirus into mice, we can cause a motor neuron disease that dramatically weakens them and shortens their survival. And so there are now several trials that have either happened or are happening to try to treat people with ALS with antiretrovirals. And so one was called the Lighthouse Trial. It was very small, just 40 people with ALS, treated for 24 weeks. They showed about a 22% slowing in the rate of decline on the ALS FRSR score compared to how people were progressing before that. Now, just recently, they published another paper showing that if they focused only on patients who had elevated HERV-K levels and had a knockdown on the antiretrovirals, the effect was much greater, more like a 50% slowing in progression. That's pretty exciting. 
And there's an even better trial underway right now at the NIH. This is an open label trial, meaning everybody's gonna get the real drug. They're looking for 200 people with ALS and they will test you to see if you have this virus being expressed. And if you have it expressed at a high level, they will treat you with this combination of antiretrovirals and try to knock down the expression of this virus and see if they can slow the progression of the disease. And again, as of yesterday, when I last checked, that trial was still enrolling. You can find it on clinicaltrials.gov. So then there's this theory about a toxin and it's called beta methyl amino alanine. And this was first identified as a possible cause for ALS on the island of Guam, where once upon a time, the risk of ALS was 50 times higher than anywhere else in the world. And scientists have been looking on that island to try to figure out where the toxin might be coming from. And they find it in multiple different places. They find it in the seeds of these plants. They find it in these animals called flying foxes. But it turns out that those things are, are pretty restricted to Guam. And now people are starting to find this toxin in the brains of people who died of ALS outside of Guam. And so people are now expanding their ideas. Where else might this toxin be coming from? Turns out one source is blue-green algae. Blue-green algae makes this toxin. And it turns out that the risk of ALS around bodies of water that are full of blue-green algae is much higher than it should be. Interestingly, another source of this toxin might be the microbiome. We all have trillions of organisms living in our guts. And there's a lot of data now coming out that alterations in that family of organisms might cause or influence progression in different diseases, including neurodegenerative diseases like ALS. And some people think there may be a bacteria called Melanobacter that can grow in our guts and produce this toxin so that some people may actually be poisoning themselves. So what's really exciting is we think we understand how this toxin kills motor neurons. It gets incorporated into proteins in place of the amino acid serine. And we can make animal models of this and we can block the ability of this toxin to make motor neurons sick by giving the animals lots of the amino acid serine specifically the L form of serine. And so there was a very small trial of L serine in people with ALS, just 20 people with ALS, mainly looking at safety and tolerability. They were randomized to four different doses of L serine and they were followed for six months. And again, mostly they were looking at safety, but this is the ALS FRS progression rate in these four groups. And what you can see is there's, there's a lot of variability but overall, there seems to be a dose response curve where people at the highest dose, which was 15 grams twice a day, had the slowest progression. Their progression rate was about a half a point per month, as opposed to you know, people that got the low dose, which again, it looks like they were progressing at about one to two points per month. And so um, from that study now, there's a new clinical trial, which is gonna be much larger. And it's, it's testing that high dose, 15 grams twice a day, over six months in people with ALS. And again, that trial's open. You can find it on clinicaltrials.gov, but I think those results are very exciting. We also understand tons of stuff about downstream pathways in ALS. And we're starting to target these downstream pathways. And I saw that one of the questions was about this drug, AMX0035, which targets something called transcriptional dysregulation and mitochondrial dysfunction with a combination of Tudka and sodium phenylbutyrate. So there's only one trial of this combination. It was six months long. It was randomized, double blind and placebo controlled. I think it was a very well done trial. It showed that on top of Riliazole, this new drug can slow ALS FRSR progression by another 30% versus placebo. Also, when they followed people in this trial for a long time to see how long they lived, people who got the AMX0035 at the beginning of the study survived six months longer than people who got it later. And so as many of you know, this is under FDA review and we, we expect to hear a final decision from the FDA here in the next month about whether they will approve this. But in the meantime, there is another trial of this underway. Um, and again, it's open for enrollment. 
whole bunch of trials underway targeting neuroinflammation. There's, there's definitely too much inflammation in the brains and spinal cords of many people with ALS. We just don't know whether that's a cause or an effect of the disease. And inflammation's complicated. It isn't just one thing. And we don't know what the right thing to go after is, but there's a lot of people going after different forms of neuroinflammation in phase three trials, and also in different phase two trials, including my own trial that's using a supplement called Theracurmin to try to change the fecal microbiome, which I think is part of the reason for the neuroinflammation. And then one last downstream pathway that most people don't think about is muscle. So ultimately all the things that are happening in ALS, they feed into the same organ, which is the muscle. This disease makes muscle shrivel up and get weak. And so, you know, targeting muscle is not gonna cure the disease, but if you could make muscle more efficient, if you could make it bigger, if you could make it contract more strongly for the same amount of electrical input, you might be able to help people preserve their function and live longer. And so there's, there's different groups trying this in different ways. <clears throat> there's a company called Cytokinetics. They have something out there called Reldeceptive, which acts on a protein in muscle, makes muscle squeeze harder for the same amount of electrical input. This is in a phase three trial now. Phase two trial showed promising trends towards slowing progression. And then I recently did a trial, very, very small trial, just 25 patients was not placebo control. We compared people's progression on an asthma drug called clenbuterol for six months of treatment versus how they were progressing before they started this. And we were not the first people to think of using clenbuterol for ALS. It was given to a, the animal model of ALS several years ago, and it seemed to slow progression. An Italian neurologist gave this to 16 of his patients, and it seemed to actually improve function over six months, but we're the first ones to do a trial where there was a control group. And again, there were many flaws in this study that can be criticized, but I was uh, very um, impressed to see about a 70% slowing in the rate of disease progression in these patients during clenbuterol treatment compared to how they did before. So I'm hoping to find a sponsor to take that forward into a bigger study. And again, there's, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many other treatments in development just checked a couple of days ago, there's 112 ALS trials listed on the website clinicaltrials.gov that are recruiting or enrolling. And I mean, in 21 years, I've never seen anywhere close to this. There's some years where there's like five or six trials enrolling, there's 112. And you know, as we get all these new ideas for how to treat ALS, the really good news is that we're getting much smarter about how to do research. So one really cool innovation is the platform trial. This is uh, my colleague, Dr. Chikovitz and um, Sabrina Paganoni from Mass General Hospital. And they got this idea from, from cancer researchers. And so in order to understand why this is innovative, you have to understand one of the most frustrating things of doing a clinical trial. If I get an idea tomorrow and I wanna try to realize this, first I gotta raise money, then I gotta write a protocol. Then I gotta submit the protocol to the FDA and, and have them give me the thumbs up and say, it's okay to do it exactly this way. Then I got to figure out who needs to do what on this protocol. And I got to get lawyers involved and get contracts in place. Then I got to get the institutional review board to approve my consent form and my design. And that whole process takes about a year. It takes me about a year from the time I get an idea to the time that I can enroll my first patient. And then you know, I do my study and it's over. And guess what? If I get another idea, I got to build all that stuff up again. So the platform trial says, why don't we just build one protocol, build it all one time. And then each time we get a new idea, we plug it into the same protocol as an addendum, much more efficient. And the example that I would use to, to sort of hammer this point home, I'm a Red Sox fan, unfortunate this year, we're off to a rough start, but imagine if we played the Yankees in Fenway Park and when the game was over, we smashed Fenway Park to the ground and we didn't play another game until we had rebuilt the entire stadium. That's the way that we're doing studies now. And the platform trial says, why don't we just build a stadium one time and keep playing all of our games there? And so this is much faster, it's much less expensive. And the way that this trial um, distributes drug to placebo, a lot more people with ALS are gonna get to try the real drug during the six months that they're in the blinded phase of this. We talked a little bit about biomarkers, neural filaments. So many ALS trials are incorporating biomarkers now 
they may be more efficient ways to measure the disease. We know the ALS FRSR score is clumsy, it's slow to change. Some of these biomarkers might be much more sensitive and specific, things like a speech and anal analytics and neurofilaments. But I'm, I'm even more excited about biomarkers that might tell us about some of those downstream pathways. Because I don't believe every one of those pathways is relevant in every patient at every phase of the disease. I believe that you know when I go to clinic on Tuesday and I see 20 patients, some of them probably have a lot of neuroinflammation going on. And others probably have next to none and they instead might have mitochondrial dysfunction that's driving the progression of the disease. And so it doesn't make sense to treat all these patients the same way. We need some way of measuring these downstream pathways. And one really cool measurement is this uh, PET ligand that picks up neuroinflammation. It picks up activated microglia. And so you inject this to people. And if there's a lot of inflammation, parts of the brain change color. And so this is a summary of 10 people with ALS. You can see that there's a lot more hot spots in the brain suggesting inflammation and 10 healthy controls that don't have those hot spots. So if I had some new drug that works specifically on this pathway, now I know how to pick patients for the study. This is probably one of my favorite things that's changed since I started my career, patient engagement. You know, early on in my career, I wondered why our studies were not enrolling very well. They were enrolling at a rate of about one to two patients per site per month. And I did a lot of surveys to try to understand this. And there's a lot of reasons, but the biggest reason was that patients were just considered to be subjects back then. They weren't really part of the research process. They were just asked, here's what we can offer you. You either do it or you don't. And you know, I, I just met so many amazing people. Good John, who's on here. I think um, you were the one that I heard say, nothing about us should ever be done without us. And I've kind of made that my mantra. And then many of you uh, know the name Brian Wallach who started IMALS. He says, better together. And really those two quotes, I mean, they're just rattling around in my brain all the time. Um, and so I've, I've just thought about well, how can we get patients more engaged and I started something called Clinical Research Learning Institutes. These are classes that teach interested patients and families to understand research better. And then afterward, once a month, we offer teleconferences with all the people that graduated from these that we call research ambassadors. We connect them to different stakeholders in the ALS space. Could be companies who have trials coming up that want patient input. Could be individual researchers like myself. Could be patient advocacy groups. Anybody can come on these calls and interact with the research ambassadors. And you know, the result of, of this has been amazing. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars raised, laws changed, trial designs, so much more patient-centric, so much better awareness. I think regulators are hearing us loud and clear now, now that we're united as a community. I mean, some of you may know that in the beginning of 2021, the FDA said it would not review MX0035, would not even consider it, for approval. And you know, engaged patients came forward and first met with the FDA and then with Congress. And then the FDA did something I've never seen them do before. They changed their mind. They said, hmm, okay, we will consider it. And so now you know, it's under consideration. Now I don't know if it'll get approved, but that's pretty extraordinary that engaged patients were able to change the mind of the FDA. And you know, some of the things I've learned from interacting with patients is that there need to be different types of trials. They can't all look the same. They can't all be the kinds of trials that companies design, which are really sort of designed to pick up small signals in a noisy disease, signals that are large enough to get FDA approval. And so I've come up with something that I call ROAR trials. These are small pilot trials of supplements mainly that are associated with some of these dramatic ALS reversals. Now, because most of these products are safe, and because I'm looking for such a huge signal, I'm not looking for a slight slowing, I'm looking for recovery from ALS, these trials have really wide inclusion criteria. Oh, I think I might've froze, still got me, okay. Yeah, these trials have really wide inclusion criteria. Just about anybody can qualify. These don't have placebos, I use historical controls. They don't have any in-person visits anymore. I'm using virtual visits. And I'm partnering with a group called Patients Like Me so that once I've taught patients how to use the site and how to measure things, patients enter their own data. And that means that all the results are available in real, real time to the whole community. So you don't have to wait years to find out the results of one of these. And I'm also publishing the protocols 
from these trials on a website. So if you don't make it into the study, because these tend to fill up really fast, then you can find the protocols on the ALS reversals website. So someone had asked earlier about Thera Kerman, you know, what to take, how much to take, what to follow. The protocols on that website. You could take that protocol into your doctor to show it to them. And, and together, if you decide it's a good idea, you can follow along outside the study, do exactly what I'm doing. And so what's happening with these Roar trials? Well, I've completed one. It was of a supplement called Lunacin, which was associated with a really dramatic reversal of Bulbar ALS. Yes, Bulbar ALS can reverse. And there was some good news and bad news. The, the bad news is, first of all, this product, which I was led to believe was very safe, had quite a few side effects. Most people had GI side effects. I even had some cases of constipation so severe I had to hospitalize people on this product. I didn't see this product doing anything to biomarkers. I didn't see it slowing, stopping, or reversing ALS in any of the 50 people that I put on it for a year. The good news is that the ROAR design worked unbelievably well. Instead of an enrollment rate of one to two patients per site per month, we enrolled more than nine patients per site per month. The people that enrolled in this study looked a lot more like all the people that I see in my clinic than the people that enroll in a typical pharma-sponsored study. So I think the results are more generalizable. And even though we enroll people that were further along in the disease, they stuck with the study. You know, they kept entering their outcome data all the way through. So I'm doing more studies like this. And the next one is, is of a form of curcumin. Curcumin is a molecule that's found in spices like turmeric and curry powder. It has a lot of ways that it could help someone with a disease like ALS. It's an antioxidant, it's anti-inflammatory. It can affect the fecal microbiome. One of the reasons I got really excited about this is it's not just associated with one ALS reversal, it's associated with nine of the 56 ALS reversals that I know about. And it seems to be pretty safe, pretty well tolerated, pretty inexpensive. And so I'm studying a specific form called Theracarmin, which we know a lot about in terms of pharmacokinetics. The trial is fully enrolled. We expect to finish the trial this summer and hopefully I'll be able to have another one of these webinars and tell the community what happened. Hopefully something good happened, but we're looking to see if we can slow stop or reverse ALS. And we're looking to see if we can change the gut microbiome with curcumin. And then finally, there's this expanding access. And you know, in my experience, every person I've ever seen with ALS wants to try things. They wanna try experimental treatments, but they can't participate in trials. And so their options have been limited. There's something out there called expanded access programs. These are FDA sanctioned programs where companies can provide the drug that they're studying to patients outside of the trial. There's something called the right to try pathway. And then there's something called self-experimentation where people just buy and try products that they read about on the internet. There haven't been very many expanded access programs in the whole history of ALS because there's a lot of barriers to them. Companies are, have traditionally been afraid to offer their products outside of a trial. Some small companies might not have had the resources. There's barriers at the physician level. Many of my colleagues don't understand how to do these. Many of us didn't have any resources at our site to do these because these don't come with budgets, unlike a research study. The right to try program didn't really work, in my opinion, because it addressed the wrong thing. It addressed the FDA. That was never the problem with people getting their hands on things. It was more the companies and the physicians. And so what's changed? Well, there's more resources now. So um, there was a grant that IMALS put out to the Healy folks, and now we have multiple expanded access programs coming out of that trial for people that don't qualify. They can get their hands on some of the products that are in that trial. Some of that money is also gonna be used to create new materials to educate physicians um, through uh, materials on a website as well as an annual training course so that doctors are more confident offering these. And then maybe most exciting of all, again, because of patient advocacy, something called Act for ALS was passed last year. It just flew through Congress, it was signed by President Biden late in the year. It's $500 million in new funds for ALS research and expanded access programs. So now if you're a small company and you feel like you don't have the resources to offer one of these, you can apply for a grant through Act for ALS and offer it. And then last but not least, we talked about this drugs and bodies problem. And so 
there's something that every scientist understands is an important tool. It's called high throughput drug screening. And the way it works is you develop an assay. Let's say in the simplest form, we wanted to find any FDA approved drug that might kill the COVID virus. Well, we can put some of the COVID virus in all those little tiny test tubes that you see there on the slide. And we can ask a computer to squirt every FDA approved drug into those test tubes and tell us which ones seem to kill COVID. So people are also using this in animal models like ALS TDI has animal models of ALS and they're screening lots of drugs to see which ones have the biggest effect on the animals. But what I've always wondered is why can't we do this in people? Why can't we get every person with ALS on some different drug or combination of drugs and see what happens over six months? And if it doesn't work, we switch up the combination. Well, the problem is there's a lot of oversight. And as I mentioned, it's going to take really uh, an amount of effort that's not sustainable as far as all the protocols and contracts and FDA approvals and IRB approvals that each one of those N of one ex experiments would require. But you could also look at this problem in a different way. This is already happening. There already are approximately 20,000 N of one experiments going on in people with ALS in the United States right now today. Problem is no one's paying attention to the results of those experiments. So what if we set up a tool where people could sign up, put down in great detail exactly what they're taking, be taught how to measure some of the same things we measure in clinical trials and enter their own data for six months on the regimen of their choice. And then the ALS community could be notified if there are combinations of things associated with unusually good progression. And then those things we would take right into clinical trials. So I'm excited to tell you that it's almost built. We're working with patients like me to, to build this. It's called the patient empowerment tool because it's mainly designed to help individuals make decisions about whether or not they're gonna stick with their regimen for longer than six months, but it's also gonna help the whole community. And so I know I've talked for a long time, but just to kind of summarize some of the things that I said, I think there's at least three reasons for hope after an ALS diagnosis. First, there's variability and progression. Nobody should tell you when you're diagnosed, you have two to three years to live because we don't know that. We don't know what someone's gonna look like in six months or six years. Many people have periods where the disease stops and those can last sometimes for decades. And there's even some people who recover from it. Second, there's a lot of things we can do about this disease. Things that slow the disease down, things that improve quality of life. And then finally, research has never been more exciting. There's more going on, we've got more ideas and we're testing those more efficiently than ever before. And so I'll just conclude by thanking most importantly, all the people with ALS who are listening. I mean, you inspire me. It's not an easy job that I have. People ask why I do it. And I say, you gotta meet these people. They're just the most amazing, inspiring folks. So I get up every day thinking what new options can I create for people with ALS? I couldn't do anything without funding. And there's a lot of people there listed on the slide that have helped me. Also without collaborators, you can see some of the individuals and organizations that helped me. And most importantly, as far as my collaborators go, is my Duke ALS team. You know, they helped me to build a foundation of great patient care at Duke, upon which all my research is based. So I'm going to turn this off and see how many questions we can get through here over the next 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah, so some questions about, you know, finding trials, finding how do you decide what trial, uh, how do you know if you qualify? So there's, there's a lot of different ways to do this. So clinicaltrials.gov is, is incredibly powerful. Every open clinical trial in the world is supposed to be listed on that website for every condition. Problem with it is it can be really cumbersome and difficult to operate. And so there are other websites that I think are a little bit easier. The Northeast ALS Consortium, has a trial search engine on their website where you can type in different things about yourself, like how many years you've had it, where you live, you know, that kind of thing, and, and it'll match you with trials. The other thing that I really like that, that the Northeast ALS Consortium has is they have a, uh, what I call a trials concierge. It's a person whose entire job it is to answer your emails and phone calls and match you up 
with ALS research studies that you qualify for. Um, and then IMALS also has a very powerful search engine on their website, and they also have ALS navigators. And you know they can help you with clinical questions that you're not getting answers to. They can also help match you up with trials, depending on what you look like, how long you've had it, what you're willing to put up with, where you live, that kind of thing. Oh, good, John. You wanted to ask how much I need to do another trial of clenbuterol. So I think I could make a compelling case to include clenbuterol in the Healy platform trial. That's really my dream is to take that into the Healy platform trial. 15 million is what that costs. So it's a big jump from 200,000, which is what my, my last trial cost to 15 million. So while I wait to find someone that has that kind of cash, I'm buying lottery tickets for the first time in my life. My, my wife saw those on the desk and asked what I was doing. And I told her I'm trying to get the money for my clenbuterol trial. Uh, hang on just just briefly, Richard. Uh, we are closing in on on uh, 90 minutes, and I just wanted to make sure that for people who do have to leave that uh, Ron had an opportunity to just thank you and say a few words in conclusion. And then for folks who can stay, and if you want to stay and continue uh, answering questions, that's awesome. Um, I think that we can keep going. But Ron, did you want to say a few words? Sure, but uh, yeah, Richard, stay on and answer the rest of those questions, please. And everyone, please stay on. Uh, there are a lot of new faces that I see and a lot of new names. So I just wanted you folks to know um, who aren't completely familiar with our work. We work with families all over Massachusetts, all over New England, uh, 40 some states around the US and many countries around the world. So the invitation is feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our work is extensive. There's much that we bring to the table. In fact, there's not one aspect of living with ALS. That there's not something that we can tap into. Maybe it's a little, maybe it's a great deal. So that's the invitation I wanted to extend to all of you. And um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So Richard, why don't you uh, get back to the questions? Thank you so much, Ron. I got, I got about 10 minutes. I'll try to get to as many of these as I can. Are doctors measuring endogenous retrovirus? Unfortunately, it's not commercially available yet. Right now, it's only available in research labs. But again, what I would say is for someone that's interested in that, you know, go, go on to clinicaltrials.gov and find that trial that's going on at the NIH and see if you qualify. Because if you do, you will get that measured in your blood. Several of my patients have participated in that study. Mark asked, you know, expound on the comment that bulbar ALS is reversible. So, I mean, I have probably out of 56 ALS reversals, probably eight to 10 that were, that were predominantly bulbar and reversed. So I don't believe that there's any age, uh, any you know, type of ALS, familial or sporadic, any severity of ALS that is not reversible. I just don't know how to make it happen yet. Um, but, I, but I believe it, it all can be reversed if we can just figure that out. This triolose act on muscle. So my understanding about triolose, it's, it's, it's uh, affecting a pathway which is called autophagy, which we didn't talk about. Autophagy is a, a pathway by which cells get rid of garbage. Every day cells have a lot going on including motor neurons, maybe muscle. I don't know, I didn't uh, see any specific data looking at autophagy in muscle, but it probably happens in muscle cells too. And you know, they, have, they have things they have to make, they, they burn energy and they create waste products. And they gotta have ways to get rid of those waste products. And the way they get rid of waste products is autophagy. And in ALS, autophagy is messed up. It's not happening like it should. Cells aren't able to get rid of the garbage, it's building up, it's part of the reason they die. We've never had a way to go after autophagy before. And so I think triolose is really cool. Berberine is an antioxidant. I'm not aware of any trials of it, um, but again, it has a plausible mechanism by which it could help somebody with ALS. This having surgeries cause ALS. So I would say that for most people with sporadic ALS, it probably isn't just one thing that needs to happen. If there was just one thing that everybody was getting exposed to, we would know it by now. It's probably a complicated interplay of susceptibility genes and multiple environmental exposures. 
So is it possible that a person needed five ex exposures over the course of their life and that some sort of surgery was the last exposure that they needed to get ALS? Yes, it's possible, but it's very difficult to prove that. Any, any benefit to starting any of the treatments if a person already has a tracheostomy? So with regard to Riliazole, I would say what we know is that it, it prolongs tracheostomy-free survival. So once a person has a tracheostomy, I'm not aware of uh, data that suggests that it's, it's doing anything. But I mean, for the other things that we talked about, sure. I mean, all the other things that I talked about could potentially help a person even with a tracheostomy. What types of cognitive impairment? Again, this is usually subtle, but it's classified as frontal and temporal impairment. So in our frontal lobes and our temporal lobes, that's where we make the most complex decisions. And so you can sit and have a conversation with someone you know, that has this problem. And as long as you don't talk about a really complicated subject where an important decision needs to be made, you wouldn't notice it. Um, but if you do more sensitive testing and you ask people to do more complicated tasks, it comes out. And that's really, if you think about it, especially cruel because we have all these things that we put in front of people now and ask them to, to make decisions. And some of these decisions are complicated. And that's why I think it's so important for families to know if their loved one has that. Someone asked about a methylcobalamin, IM injections. So you may have noticed, I guess it was about five days ago, a Japanese group published a follow-up study and um, it suggested that intramuscular methylcobalamin high doses, which is a precursor to vitamin B12, might slow the progression of ALS, at least for a few months. But there's some fine print. The only people that that seems to work in are people who've had symptoms for less than 12 months. So the first study that they did, which they referenced from three or four years ago, was overall negative. It didn't seem to have an effect on everybody with ALS. But again, they went and they looked, did it help anyone? Well, it looks like maybe it helped people in the first 12 months of their symptoms. So this new study was only people in the first 12 months of their symptoms. So we, we don't have any evidence that it helps people beyond 12 months of symptoms. <clears throat> 15 mil is not much of the drug business. You're right, good job. When I see, when I see the, the contracts that some of these uh, athletes and musicians and performers get, I feel like if I could just get in front of the right people and show them uh, some of the things that I showed you today, we might be able to, you know, to get that funding. Any trials for people with 25 plus years living with ALS? So Beth, a couple of things I would say. Um, one is that, I mean, we're very interested in, in how someone can do so well for so long and that we are collecting microbiome samples in people with incredibly slow progression like that. We'd love to get some samples from you. We can do that through the mail. And two, you know, my ROAR trials, which I hope to open another one um, in 2023, once I finish Thera Kerman, those don't have any disease duration requirement. So if you just keep your eye on my website, I will announce the next ROAR trial when I get it off the ground. How do you as an engaged, committed physician navigate the complexities of grief and end of life conversations? How do you think that the psychosocial, spiritual, interdisciplinary support enhances quality of life and, and, and longevity? So um, I, try to, I try to talk to my patients as if I was talking to someone in my family. And that means I'm very honest with them and I take my time and I make sure that we do it in an environment that's conducive to, to listening. So we're not like in a hallway on a bench with a million people walking by. And I try to use language that I think is appropriate for the patient and family's level of education. I've got some people who have more education than I do. And I've got others who didn't finish high school. And I think the words that you use need to be different. Um, but I mean, I feel my emotions and there's days when I drive home and I'm crying, but I've got to find a way to rally myself and, and remind myself what did I do for each person with ALS this day? And there's always something that I've done for every person, some new option that I was able to provide for every single person that I see. And so that pulls me out of that. And you know, we just got to focus on other things. I mean, 
you know, the, the crazy clothes, believe it or not, are a tool that I use to stay positive. Um, my family, my pets, my friends, I mean, all those kinds of things. But I mean, I do, I think, you know, most doctors, we do feel, we do feel our emotions. It's part of being a good doctor, I think, is empathy. And I've, I've told my family, because they're, they're like, how long are you going to stay in this? I said, either until I fix it or until I don't feel those emotions anymore. Because if I don't feel them anymore, it's time for me to go. Um, and some of the things that I hear that doctors have said to patients make me think that we've got some burned out physicians in this country um, that have lost empathy. So, yeah, and I mean, obviously there's tremendous um, emotions with, with the families, the patients and families that we see. You know, there's always going to be grief, but people process that grief in different ways. And we try to relate to each person, you know, with our, with our team, our social worker spends a lot of time, not just in clinic, but in between on the phone, trying to help people process grief. And again, it's, it's processed in all different ways. Some people are, you know, they're tearful the minute you have a difficult conversation and, you know, other people um, get angry. And we've had some people go online and say some nasty things. And it's hard when you're very passionate about what you do and somebody, you know, goes on to Facebook or Twitter and says something nasty about you. I'm not going to lie. It's, 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 it's hurtful, but you just have to realize that's how they're processing their grief. They get to process it in their own way. You just have to take a deep breath and, and move on. Nicholas asks, how is uh, onset of symptoms defined when it comes to methylcobalamin? So most people would define it as the first unexplained weakness. So not fasciculations, not cramps, not fatigue, the first unexplained weakness. Scrolling up here to see if I've got any other ones that I didn't get to yet. Rick, I have one from a guy who wrote to me, if I could go ahead and read that. And I don't know, you may have already answered this, but just out of respect for him, it's from John, John Crosby in Hyannis. He's asked, uh, what can AMX0035 possibly do for me if it's approved? I'm 80 and been living with slow progression of ALS since about 2011. My overall health is good. I can't walk talk, or talk and have difficulty swallowing. Eats a pureed diet, left hand is paralyzed. Feed myself with right hand becoming more difficult. Yep. So are you? did you say anything about AMX0035? I did, I did. So the one trial that we have suggests that it can, it can slow progression as measured on a disability scale and it can prolong survival above and beyond what really is all does. So the way I would you know, further explain this to a patient is I would say, you've, you've told me about some things you can't do. Well, I, I don't have proof that this can give you back those things, but you also told me about some things that you can do. And don't you wanna to try to hold on to those things that you can do for as long as possible? And, and this drug it appears to me would help you hold on to those things you can do longer. So that's why I've you know, been passionate about trying to advocate for this, testified at the hearing, written letters to the FDA to try to get them to approve it. He also asked about drug mm -hmm. 1501 or 1510. Is that mm -hmm. anything you know about? Yeah, AT1510 or uh, yeah, AT15, is it 10 or 1501? I can't remember, but it's the, uh, it's the drug that ALS TDI um, came up with. And it's another uh, drug that's, um, I believe, based upon the idea of neuroinflammation and trying to target um, the activation of a particular cell type, which I think was monocytes that they're after. So yeah, I mean, I think all the, all the different downstream pathways are worth going after. I just wish we had better ways to figure out who has those downstream pathways, you know, driving the progression of their disease. I think I've gotten to most of the questions and I promised my mom I would come over and take her to a late brunch. So I'm gonna have to sign off, but you know, my email's all over the internet. Feel free to email me if there's questions that you have burning questions I didn't get to. And again, I just wanna say thank you for spending some of your Sunday with me and thanks to Ron and, and James for inviting me. Yeah, Richard, thank you so much. And again, folks, uh, 
Richard, Dr. Richard Bedlack is one of those physicians where he really means, feel free to reach out to him, send him an email. I know he responds. Richard, thank you so much. And my All best right. to your mother. Thank Enjoy you so much. Enjoy thank the you. rest of your Sunday. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Yep. Bye-bye.